I would now like to bring to the stage, everyone's really relaxed now, right? <laughs> Our wonderful superintendent, Dr. Jarita Polstaway. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks, Joe, for that. We really, again, appreciate your being here this morning. And I want to just give a shout out to the event staff. Those are our staff members, um, Erica Taylor, Beth Havens, all of the people who've worked with them, many of the district staff who've worked long and hard, been here till midnight several, several nights this week, and we're here at 5 this morning. Please thank the folks in the blue shirts and others for the work they did to help, help make this possible. Thank you. Last spring, when the uh, Strategic Planning Committee met, met, they were 35 people representing all walks of life, business people, clergy, community members, parents, and educators. They came out of that um, two and a half day planning event with five strategies. We will embrace students' agency in every aspect of their education. In other words, their self-direction, their responsibleness, their resourcefulness, their self-actualization will redefine teaching and learning, will nurture an ethical culture of excellence, will ensure the organization is effective, and will create a mutually respectful bond with all segments of the community. This morning, we're talking about those strategies in four kind of pieces. The readiness, if kids are self-directed and can access, retrieve, process, produce information, have the right kinds of skills and attributes, they will be able to, to engage productively after school. Relevance, making sure that what we're teaching and the ways we're teaching and creating learning environments fit today's world and today's kids. The, the responsiveness, ensuring that our organization is adapting and responding to the needs of people, the children in our school system and those in the community. And finally, relationships. And that's one of the reasons we're here this morning, to start beginning to come together, to stay together, to use our hearts, our minds, our energies, to say what can we do on behalf of the youth of Charleston County. We want to start by just saying there are some barriers. The biggest barrier we face is that the system, the K-12 system in which we work and live, was never, ever designed to bring all of the children to high levels of achievement. It's a bell curve system where some kids get A's and B's and others get C's and D's and pretty much we move them through the system. And because we've had that system for so long, the traditions of that system are in our DNA. Many of us who work in the system and those for whom the system works have a sense of complacency about that. But if the system doesn't work for you or was never intended to work for you, you, have, you might have deep anger, which leads to distrust and despair. So we bring all of those realities into this work with us, and we simply wanted to acknowledge them as we start. We want to recall the words of Ron Edmonds, uh, one of the original effective schools researchers from the 19, late 70s and early 80s, who found schools here and there who had high poverty populations, but who were bringing all of their children to high levels of achievement. He asked, how many effective schools would you have to see in order to be persuaded of the educability of poor children. If your answer is more than one, then I suggest you have reasons of your own for per persisting in your belief that home background is the biggest determinant of education success. He famously said, we can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. Whether or not we do that, must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't done it so far. We can do it in one school and a school here and a school here, but our nation has never learned how to scale those successes across the system. That's what we're hoping to do in Charleston County in the weeks and months and years to come. So as we think about what it means to be ready how do we get children ready to step productively and successfully into the world after they leave us? We have to start by looking at where we are. So we're sharing four slides with you that we took throughout the district to every constituency last year and showed what had happened to us. 
These are slides from the 2014-15 school year. Here we see the end of course test results. The blue results <clears throat> represent the achievement of African American children, green, Hispanic, and red, the white children. And you see some gaps, but if you look at that mathematics column, the second column here, you see the district had made a tremendous amount of progress. Some wonderful work occurred in the previous five to 10 years in this district, resulting in Charleston County School having been named an excellent school district that year. And that work was well deserved and the honor well earned. But when we next year administered a nationally normed test to our kids, see these tests, these end of course tests were designed by South Carolina and they set the level of achievement. But when we looked at the national tests, we gave all of our children the college entrance exam that Trident Tech accepts and uh, the four-year colleges accept, we saw a very different, tragic, heartbreaking picture. A heartbreaking picture. When you look at the readiness levels of African American children, it's hard to look the public in the eye and say, this is where we are. If you look at the fact that across our district, about the half the children are well enough prepared to go to a two or four year college and persist and finish, um, that makes us really heart sick. And so it's with those facts that we're looking at where we are. When uh, we look at how that, that readiness manifests itself, here in Charleston County, the graduates who went on to Trident Tech found themselves admitted to Trident Tech, but 90% of the children matriculating to Trident Tech from Charleston County Schools had to take remedial courses. They couldn't start, they had to pay to take remedial courses that, that they got no credit for. So in the future, in Charleston County, we'll be telling you how many of our graduates are ready to enter Trident Tech, and we expect that percentage to get better and better and better every year, because we're gonna start administering that entrance exam at the sophomore year and using junior and senior years to get our kids ready. And then the final data slide we wanna look at very quickly um, <clears throat> are these data. On the suspension and expulsion rates, we see a huge disparity between the suspensions and expulsions of white children and African American children. We're, um, we were putting too many kids out of school, so what we wanna do is number one, ensure every child has the right to learn, every teacher has the right to teach. We have safe schools, but when children aren't, aren't doing well in a regular classroom, we have an alternative approach that doesn't put kids out on the street where they don't get any nurturing or support from the public system. In order for us to think about how to get kids ready, once we see where we are, and we think about where we need to go, then we're looking at relevance. How do we transform teaching and learning from the kind of batch processing bell curve system we have to a system that operates differently? Let's look at what our goals are for our graduates. Two years ago, South Carolina adopted a brand new um, aspiration for its graduates. We live in a in a state where the Constitution calls for a minimally adequate education for its children. And yet we have a state board, the legislature, the business community that have come together and say we want our kids not only to have deep knowledge, to have foreign languages, science, technology, education, mathematics training, to be well versed in a number of subjects, but we want to make sure that they have the kinds of world class skills creativity, problem solving, the ability to process information and, and sort out sense from nonsense, news from non-news. And then we want them to have the kind of skills we all need to work and live and exist together. So we think about readiness and relevance in terms of those kinds of dimensions. And then we look locally at the kind of opportunities we have. We have a real opportunity to break some deep cycles of poverty in our community, to benefit our local citizens. Instead of the employers who are coming to us from around the world to situate here, having to bring in 25 to 30 people per day to fill jobs, we can get our own citizenry ready for those jobs. But most of them require very high levels of skill, of thought process, of problem solving, of creativity, critical thinking. And we've got to think about how to improve up our game, reach more kids, and close that opportunity gap. That means we have to be more responsive. What does a responsive system looks like, look like? 
if a system is operating ethically and organizing so that we are responding, we have to let go of the way we did things in the past. And this is hard for us. So we, we end up with distrust, with a lot of tension and, and um, um, arguments over insignificant things, like what color of beige the cafeteria wall was painted. And we simply can't afford to do that. We've got to sort out the really big high leverage issues from those that just don't make that much difference one way or another. So what does it look like when an organization begins to do that? A responsive system I think of as the sort of the, the climbing walls that we see. We, we intend for every child to get to the top of that wall. They may go up a little bit differently, and what we have is harnesses and supports and encouragement to help them go whatever way they need to get up the wall. We expect success for all. We'll report metrics to you. When we leave here today, you'll hear from us at least every two weeks about how we're doing on this kind of work, the strategic work. And parents and kids and teachers in the community will know um, annually what kind of progress we're making toward the outcomes that we agree together our children should succeed, should, should achieve. As I've said, there'll be multiple pathways to success. We can only get there if we stop doing a thousand different things and get really clear on what makes a difference for kids, support and, and develop our teachers to be able to deliver those things with fidelity every day, on time, all the time. That's the only way our system's going to reach these high goals that we've set for our kids. And then finally, there has to be a relentless intentionality about our work. We cannot be relaxed. We cannot be take for granted things are going to turn out. We have to be looking at our outcomes all the time. That means we have to find a better way to measure where kids are on the growth chart. Until the latest technologies came into place, we didn't have a way to do that. But now there are technologies that let us know by studies of the test results, the achievement results of millions of Americans who are, say, age 25 to 30, when we look, go back and look and see where they were in kindergarten, where were they scoring in the third grade, it allows researchers to say there are four different ways we can tell you um, where your third grader or your fifth grader or your eighth grader is with respect to four different kinds of goals. This line would be the line that uh, a child would need to be on, the, the achievement level, if he were going to try to go to an Ivy League college an Ivy League university, a Harvard, a Stanford, a Columbia, a Duke, a Furman, so forth. Um, that's that line. If we were going to try to get into state universities, USC, for example, Clemson, this would be where the achievement would have to fall. This is for Trident Technical College. And this line is right now where the military, the Army, has the ASVAB score set. So in, you have to have 31 on the ASVAB to get into the military, and you can't have any arrest record. Then what we can say to every parent, for any child, this is where your child is. Our job is to make sure we grow that child in order to be in the military, Trident Tech, a, a four-year college, or Harvard, this is where your child needs to be, so let's work together and make sure we're getting the growth we need. So that means we have to grow kids. Most of our kids have to grow more than a year um, in a year. This is what we see now when we get inside those data and look at our system. Here's what this chart means. If you're blue or green, up here this light blue or green, those kids are growing more than a year and a half to two years per year. So they're really moving through the system and accelerating. If, if the yellow bar, the yellow bars represent kids who are growing one year per year. The red represents kids in our system who aren't growing right now at the rate of a year per year. So the longer they go in our system, the further behind they're falling compared to their peers. We have to be able to look at data that way. And we've never been able to do that because we didn't have the technologies to help us make that a practical exercise. Piloted in some of our schools this year and, and rolled out to all of our schools next year will be this kind of 
supplement to the report card. Every parent will know for your child, here's where your child is with respect to those different colleges, college lines, or technical college lines, or national career certifications, or military, so that you know exactly where your child is, and then we can look at the beginning of the year, at the middle of the year and the end of the year. And if what we've been doing isn't working, then we'll revise what we're doing. That's what it means to be responsive. We're responding to where kids are, not to where the curriculum pacing guide said we needed to be today, but with the idea that every child needs to be growing all the time. It means that we take all these different things we have going on in our system and align them so that we're all working inside the system and the partnerships that are working with us, headed toward, heading, heading our efforts together toward every student being prepared. That continual growth and the kind of uh, metrics we'll report to the community is how much growth a school is getting. We'll also be resigning <clears throat> our, our financial resources toward that effort. I love this picture, right? They have, they have the tools, but don't quite know how to use them. And there's a lot of that in public education. We get lots and lots of tools, but we never have time to learn how to use them or develop them. So it just doesn't matter how many resources we have, if we're not using them so that they make a difference, um, then we're not going to see the results we wanted. Finally, um, that fourth R, the relationships. And that's why we're here this morning, to start building, we hope, mutually trustful, respectful relationships involving you, sharing with you what we're doing, and building from here to say, how do we rethink what we've been doing? Make what's working even better for the children for whom it is working, and totally change what has resulted in very disappointing outcomes for some of our kids. Now there's a lot going on in our system um, that's kind of represented in, in, in all of these um, hexagons that you see here. The most important three are the improved achievement, which comes, we think, with redefining teaching and learning and the way we measure, recruiting and supporting top talent, um, and putting in place a lot of different kinds of student supports. I've talked a bit about the metrics and the dashboard, the different way we're looking at student achievement results. I haven't said anything about access and opportunity, but we want to tell you there is a huge push to look at diversity training and making sure all of us understand our biases, how those biases um, um, emerge in the work we do every day, in looking at our magnet school, partial magnet options, rethinking how we get opportunities to every child in every part of our huge school district. Um, uh, there'll be a big push that we're not talking about yet today on parental engagement. And then there, there are a lot of other things going on. We have these eight constituent areas and, and some specialized work is going on in each of them. In Johns Island, here on the peninsula, we'll be working on a K-12 feeder pattern, um, looking at um, the new tech here at Burke uh, there's some District 3 work with a new school opening, West Ashley Study Group, a lot of new career offerings in District 23. We have a brand new construction program coming on online for the next five years. Um, huge work going on. The District 1 and 2 constituent boards are collaborating. And then in North Charleston, there will be a large study group. The next uh, Career and Technical Education Center to open will be in North Charleston. So lots of big decisions to be made there. And I just want to signal that what you're going to be involved in today is not all this district is doing, but it's a big piece of it. Our purpose for today, in a word, is to put our heads together to see what good we can do for our children. How can we unite? How can we stay together? How can we measure our successes? How can we handle our tensions and disagreements so that they don't bog us down and cause us to lose uh, attention and focus and motivation um, toward those things that we are beginning to see are making a positive difference. Um, someone's going to talk with you about the different symposium sessions in just a little bit. I'll leave this up for just a moment so you can get, get a, a chance to uh, review it. I'll also step out of the way. That would be helpful. And then 
the time I've had this morning has just been a, a bit of a flyover of what we're trying to do in the district to set context for you on the, the culture we're trying to create, the work we're trying to do, the service we're trying to provide. Change leadership is very difficult. Being an educator today is not for wimps. It is hard work. Your heart has to be in it. You have to care more about kids than you care about caustic criticism. You must commit and care and stay the course even though it is very difficult work. From my point of view, it's God's work. And we're about it every day. But it's hard. Michael Fullen said, leading change is like starting out on a planned journey in uncharted waters on a leaky boat with a mutinous crew. Change is very, very hard, but we are committed to it, and we pledge to you that we are here to make a difference for all of the kids. We just want to remind ourselves of something that local historian Charles Joyner said. Some may say there's been no progress, but they've forgotten where we started. Some would stop here, for they cannot see how far we have to go. We know we have a long way to go, but we also know we stand on the shoulders of other great educators who came before us. There are some rich and wonderful traditions, and there's some tragic history to overcome. We acknowledge all of that as we invite you into our homes, into our hearts, to say, what together might we do for our children? Thank you.